He said, Mrs. Bermitz, there's a war on. What can I tell you about Dunkirk? The place was a mess. You know, it was pretty frightening then, but it's the noise that uh, is frightening. Well, I think I was too young to understand that I wouldn't ever see them again. Were you ever scared? Yes, most of the time. Well, they were doing very secret research on atomic physics. Like the atomic bomb? Yes. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. Welcome back to Harold's War. The year is 1943 and the world holds its breath. The tide of conflict begins to turn as fortunes shift in our favour. Following US troops joining Allied forces and German advances faltering, a cautious optimism emerges. Yet in homes across Britain, uncertainty still mingles with hope. Throughout the war, a remarkable resilience had defined the British spirit. There persisted a deep-rooted belief that this island nation could, if tested, repel a Nazi invasion. This unwavering resolve echoes in a poignant conversation between young Daniel and his nana, Kathleen, my mother. Though her speech was limited by a stroke, her wartime memories remain vivid. Yes. This is you in the National Fire Service, isn't it? Yes. 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 All your friends? Yes. Yes. They all your friends? Yes. And that's you there? Yes. What were you doing? Making toys and yes. cloth? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Did it take you a long time? Yes. <laughs> Did you do it in your free time? Yes. Was it scary in the war? Um, yes. Um, More exci exciting and nervous? Yes, yes. Knowing if you were going to lose or you are going to win? Yes. Mm. Were you ever scared as in we're going to lose? And well, um, <sighs> Not really? Yes. You always thought we were going to win? Yes. Now the Germans are dive bombing a convoy out into the sea. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's one going down on his target now. Bomb. No, he missed the ships. He hasn't hit a single ship. There are about ten ships in the convoy. But he hasn't During hit a single the Battle one. of Britain, did you ever think Germany would successfully invade Britain? Daniel then talked to family friend Harold Rose. Uh, that's a question. Um, not successfully. We thought that they would try, although there was a great deal of confidence at the time about the ability of the uh, British Navy. And of course the speeches of Churchill were wonderfully encouraging. So we thought that they might try, but I think we had every expectation that, that they wouldn't manage to get through. Right. Right, yes, oh, we just hit a Messerschmitt. Oh, that was beautiful. He's coming right down now. I think definitely that's the that first contest. Absolute steep dive. Let's move around so I can wash him a bit more. Here he comes. And he's going flat into the sea, and there he goes. Flat. Oh, boy, I've never seen anything so good as this. The, the RAF fighters have really got these boys today. At what point did you think the war had turned? After Alamein, the Battle of Alamein in North Africa, I think that was the, the great turning point when people realised that uh, Germany were not invulnerable or, and that um, they could be defeated. And I think people were then beginning to see the build-up of American uh, power. These personal accounts reflect the resilience that defined Britain during those uncertain times. In homes across the nation, families anxiously awaited news of their loved ones. Kayla had recently returned from the Royal Bath Hospital in Harrogate, where she'd received treatment for her worsening rheumatism. Kayla found her aching joints mirrored the unease in her heart. She spoke often to the radio, as if her words could somehow reach her boys in uniform. 
All she knew about David was that he was somewhere in Italy after invading Sicily via North Africa. But what about Italy? Why aren't they telling us about Italy? What Kayla didn't know, but maybe sensed, was that David, serving with the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, was about to take part in one of the bloodiest battles of the campaign, Monte Cassino. Harold Burmitz picks up the story. It's a bit unusual for a Jewish Yorkshireman, isn't it? <laughs> and he was in Africa, Sicily, and all the way through Italy. And he was at Mont was a, a place called Monte Cassino. I'll give you a book over there about what happened there. And a dangerous job. A a very dangerous job, yes. Did um, some of his friends die? Too? I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. They killed. When he was away, did you see him during the war? No. Not at all? Uh, we never saw him until he came home. Harold's stories bring to life the dangers David faced on the front lines. But the war touched everyone, even those far from the action. Back home, the two eldest Burmitz brothers, Elick and Jack, faced their own unique challenges. Deemed unfit for military service, they found themselves navigating wartime civilian life. While David was making history, Jack was battling an enemy he never expected, a stubborn case of dermatitis. Ironically, his career as a hairdresser, with daily exposure to various hair products, likely aggravated the condition. It just goes to show, heroes come in all forms. Some carry the weight of the world, others carry hand cream. <laughs> Lots of hand cream. Over the years, family anecdotes paint an intriguing picture of Jack. Despite sharing the same upbringing as his brothers, he spoke with an inexplicably posh accent. We have a letter from Jack to David that offers a revealing glimpse into his character and the close bond they shared. Dear David, there is no doubt that you must be very annoyed with me for not writing before, but you can honestly believe me that it was impossible to write sooner. Unfortunately, I contracted dermatitis, which turned septic on my right hand, and consequently, I've been off work for a long time, unable to do anything with my right hand. Well, how are things with you, son? I can guess. Did you ever receive that parcel from the Comforts Fund of the Daily Mail? Please let me know, and if not, we'll make inquiries. Incidentally, I've just sent you five handkerchiefs. They are khaki-coloured, and I hope you'll find them useful. <laughs> you remember my friend, Saul Myers? Well, he is now flight engineer on bombers and goes out on ops. General Montgomery has been touring and visiting troops. In fact, Montgomery even came to Beverly Westwood in what was supposed to be a secret inspection. So secret, the whole town turned out to watch. <laughs> But for Kayla, personal concerns overshadowed these events. Her youngest son, Harold, was now facing his own call to service. Just a few days before his 19th birthday, Harold prepared to leave for Scotland to report for RAF training in our broth. I never thought it would come to this, Hershey. Don't worry, Mum. I can look after myself. I'll write to you as often as I can. But I won't be able to reply. You're my letter writer. You don't have to reply, Mum. It's OK. Make the Bermit's name proud. I know you will. Harold embraced his parents, the weight of the moment hanging heavy in the air. He kissed his mother's cheek, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. Then, turning to his father, he shook his hand firmly before pulling him into a quick, tight hug. With a final glance at them both, Harold shouldered his bag and stepped out into the uncertain future that awaited him. Kayla called after him. We love you, son. Harold paused, his back to them. He turned slowly, blew a kiss, and placed his hand over his heart, a silent promise. As the door closed behind their youngest son, Kayla and Israel stood in silence, the house suddenly feeling emptier than ever before. We interrupt this broadcast for an important announcement. Allied forces have launched a massive invasion of occupied Europe. D-Day had begun, 
It was the news the nation had been waiting for. The Allies invaded Western Europe by the Normandy beach. These boys are, are apparently having uh, a pretty tough time in here on the beaches. It's not very pleasant. Uh, it's exposed, and it must have been a rugged fight. In the days following D-Day, a steady stream of reinforcements poured into Normandy. My father was among them, crossing the channel to provide advanced signal support for the RAF. Each soldier carried with them a printed letter from General Dwight Eisenhower. Soldiers, sailors and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade towards which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. The effort must be forthcoming. There's no moment now to slack. Hard as it may seem after five long years of war to take a new surge of impulse out of yourselves. And I am sure our soldiers at the front who will not be found are incapable of that extra effort which is necessary and above all to bring this slaughter and devastation in Europe uh, to an end. I think we're going to beat that Mamza Hitler. What do you think, Israel? I think you're right, Kayla. You're always right. In August 1944, Harold had transferred out of the RAF, hoping to join David in the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. But he went into the buffs instead. Harold reported to his commanding officer in a small, airless office. Dimly lit, it contained only the commanding officer and a soldier in the corner, laboriously typing on a heavy typewriter. Permits. A fair report from your RAF training. I'm not sure what to do with you. Well... I can type faster than him for a start. <laughs> OK, show me. Harold approached the typewriter, reaching to remove his backpack. Keep the backpack on, Bernitz. Awkwardly taking the seat vacated by the reluctant typist, Harold began. The key sprang to life under his rhythmical control. The machine alive. The repeated pings of carriage returns echoed like the healthy pulse of an athlete. Harold flew through the ribbon, finishing with a flourish. Both the commanding officer and typist raised their eyebrows in surprise. Harold paused, not breaking a sweat. Is something wrong, sir? On the contrary, Bermitz. Any other hidden talents? Oh, I've, I've got a certificate in shorthand, sir. OK, you're now my clerk. The former typist pointed out that Harold couldn't be a clerk because he wasn't a corporal. The commanding officer paused for a moment, then replied... Hmm. Well, he is now. <laughs> Promoted on his first day. And so began Harold's path to administering some of the regiment's most critical operations, alongside more offensive military training. Good evening. This is a special report on Allied advances in France. The struggle to push deeper into Europe continues. The German resistance remains fierce and determined, with significant counterattacks reported across the front. Despite the relentless efforts of our troops, the enemy's defences are proving to be a formidable challenge. Allied forces are engaged in intense battles as they work to secure and expand their positions. The fight is far from over, but every advance brings us closer to victory. It's taking too long to push the Germans back. We're still moving forward. Slow progress is still progress. I know, I know. It's just the waiting, the worrying. Harold had a few days leave towards the end of November 44 and returned home, much to Kayla's delight. Oh, Hershey, my boy. How are they treating you? Oh, you look tired. Are you hungry? I'll make you something to eat. Oh, can I get through the door first? Oh. I'm just so happy to see you. Have you heard from uh, David and Solly? Or will you help me write to them? I'm long overdue in replying. After several bowls of chicken soup, Harold sat down with pen in hand to take his mother's dictation, writing to David in Italy. My dear son, 
I have received a few letters, and as you keep asking if I would like anything, there is one thing you could get for me. That is a very good handbag, providing it won't be too expensive. <laughs> oh, the way this war is progressing, my son, it won't be very long before you are home. I don't have to tell you it is Harold writing this letter for me. He is home on leave and is writing himself away. Oh, I keep showing everyone the presents you sent me from Egypt. It's marvellous, and you certainly know what to spend your money on. Sol expects to come on leave Saturday. Oh, you boys will show this town after the war. Even though you have been away such a long time, nobody has forgotten you, and I am being asked repeatedly how you are and when you will come home and dance with all the girls. Oh, you must be an expert at the Highland Fling. <laughs> Dad and I still go to the pictures every week. And of course, Father must have the chocolate before he will think of moving. Well, my son, I will be writing again very soon. So chin up, and all my love, Mother and Father. Following a period of leave at home, largely spent indulging in Kayla's home cooking, Harold returned to duty. He now faced the sixth winter of the war, his first on active service, immersed in operational administration. While the work was tedious, it was vital, coordinating troop movements and managing complex supply lines. As Harold settled into the role, memories of home got him through long nights of paperwork. Meanwhile, his brothers found themselves scattered across the war effort. Solly had been assigned to the Royal Army Service Corps at Oxford, and David now faced the harsh realities of combat on the front lines in northern Italy far from the warmth of Kayla's kitchen. Every day, Harold wondered where he'd be sent next. The thought of Burma kept him awake at night, the dread of telling his mother weighing heavily on his mind. Despite the Allies' progress, the prolonged conflict took its toll on the home front. Allied forces continue their push through northern Italy, facing fierce German resistance. In the Pacific, American troops make slow but steady progress, island hopping towards Japan. At home, the mounting pressure becomes too much for Kayla to bear. This has to stop. Nearly six years of war. I can't stand it anymore. Don't worry, Kayla. Not long now, Emma. Oh, don't tell me not to worry. How can I not worry? David in Italy, Solly away, and now Harold's going to Burma. <gasps> Israel goes to comfort her, but Kayla's voice becomes slurred as she calls out. Israel! Israel! Kayla suffered a major stroke, leaving her in a critical condition. In an instant, her world fell into profound silence. Meanwhile, Harold was waiting to board a troop ship bound for Burma. He steeled himself for the long journey ahead. Suddenly, a soldier approached him and broke the news that his mother had been taken ill and that he had compassionate leave with immediate effect. Harold rushed to his mother's bedside joining the rest of the family. Alec, Jack, Solly, Dad and me. We were all there. But Mum, she never opened her eyes. The doctor said she could hear us, maybe. So we talked to her, held her hand, told her we loved her. And then, just a few hours after I arrived, she was gone like she'd been holding on. I, I hope... I hope she knew we were there at the end. In the wake of Kayla's passing, the Burmitz family observed the traditional Jewish mourning rituals. As night falls, Israel gathers his sons, Elik, Jack, Solly and Harold, around the dining room table. Boys... It's time to light the Yorkshire memorial candle for your mother. With slightly trembling hands, Israel lights the Yorkshire candle, allowing it to burn for 24 hours. By the time a new candle is lit, the burial will already have taken place, as is Jewish tradition. Over the eight days of mourning, as the family sits shiver, the flickering Yorkshire flame is rekindled on a daily basis to become a constant companion for the bereaved. May the soul of Kayla Bat Yitzhak be bound up in the bond of eternal life. The family watched the candle in silence, 
its warm glow a comfort in their grief. Israel's eyes are distant, lost in memory. Your mother always said the Yorkshire candle's like a soul, burning bright and true. She never forgot to light one for her own mother every year, and now we'll do the same for her. May her memory be a blessing. As the candle burns through the night, its light a testament to Kayla's enduring presence in their lives. Israel beckons to Harold to write, as he dictates a letter to David's commanding officer in Italy to impart the sad news. Dear sir, Harold takes up the pen, while Solly gently rests his hand on his father's shoulder. Israel's voice trembles with emotion as he continues. It is with a heavy heart that I must inform you of the passing of my wife, Kayla Bermitz. Although Israel's letter is lost to time, we do have the compassionate message passed on by David's commanding officer, along with David's poignant reply to his father. On February 26, 1945, Major N.R. Davis penned this letter to David. Dear Bermit, I have had a letter from your father containing some extremely sad news and the request that I announce it to you. It concerns your mother. She was recently taken ill very suddenly and seriously, and on Sunday the 18th of February, she passed away. It seems that she suffered a stroke and died without regaining consciousness. I cannot say how sorry I am to send you this sad news and that you should have this grief to bear so far away from your own people. If it were in my power to do so, I would send you home. But as you know, that is impossible. You have my sincere sympathy. Home can never be quite the same for you. I hope you will be comforted and be able to comfort your suffering father. There should be a Jewish padre in your present location. Could you not see him? Your father would like to think that the special prayers for your mother have been said. Yours, Major Bernard Davis. David received this letter on March the 4th, 1945. The next day, on March 5th, he responded to his father. My dear father, yesterday I received the news in the form of a letter from my officer. I was getting ready to spend the day in Naples and therefore proceeded there with some of my friends. On arriving, I went immediately to the Jewish chaplain and instructed him to send you a telegram. I said Kaddish, listened to his kind sympathy and left. There was nothing more that I could do. I did not cry, nor did it seem as a great shock. We talk of strange premonitions, yet often I had that strange feeling and know that someday God's will will be done. Of us all, I am the most fortunate for I said goodbye nearly two years ago, during which time I have treasured only a memory and so I have nothing to get used to. Nor have I been deprived of anything for one cannot be deprived of a memory. Yet only too well do I know that you, more than any of us, have been hurt so deeply. It is because of this, and because I know you so well, that I beg you to take courage and hold on. For someday, I shall come home, and I want you to be there. I know that the courage that I have shown in action was inherited from you. There are six of us, Pop, and you are the captain. So I look to you to keep us together as a family. So don't let me down, Skipper. There is one more thing. All of you will be suffering untold agony over me, for I know how difficult it must have been for you to impart such news to me, and you will also be grieving because I was not there with you. Whilst appreciating this, I nevertheless want you to stop worrying over me as I have the strength and the youth to absorb such sorrow and remain punching. I know you will forgive me, but as there was so little I could do for myself, I spent the day in a wine shop. 
Nor am I ashamed to say that I got good and really drunk. <laughs> and my friends who remained there with me guided me back. Swear that I sang every Scottish song that was ever composed. <laughs> so you see, Dad, that no good can be gained by you worrying over me. In fact, my only concern is for you. But if you write me and give me a word that you will carry on, then I will be far happier. How are you managing about food? <laughs> I once saw Tol cook a chicken and I've seen Alec make chips for himself. But what I've never seen is Jack behind an apron. So <laughs> I shouldn't trust him to the cooking pops as he's liable to shave the chicken first and shampoo the spuds. <laughs> I'm still on this course, so I shall be here till the 17th. But send all mail to my battalion and they will forward it on if necessary. Oh, I've sent some nuts to Harold and Sol and if there is anyone that has been particularly kind to you at all, let me know and I'll send them a box too. <laughs> well, Dad, I guess that's everything. Please take care of yourself and I know but being a Bermit, you won't let me down. Your loving son, David. P.S. Have I your permission to get a wee bit drunk now and again? <laughs> Back in England, the Bermit's family had to navigate their way through the immediate aftermath of Kayla's passing. Leslie and Sarah Levy, long-time friends of the Bermitses, proved to be a pillar of support during this difficult time. They went above and beyond, even offering Israel a place to stay. After sitting shiver, Solly and Harold prepared to return to their military duties, leaving their father in the care of Elick, Jack and the Levy family. On March 13th, 1945, Solly, stationed with the RASCHQ in Oxford, wrote to David. Dear David, your letter came as a tonic to me, David, for, to be quite honest, I was rather confused as to what action you would take. It seems that my fears were unfounded, and I'm quite honest in saying you took it better than I did. You're a better man than I, Gungadin. You've no idea how much your letter bucked the old man up too, David. Harold and I were at home, and sat shiver with Elick, Jack and Dad. It'll take quite a while for the old man to snap out of it, but have no fear. He's a Bermix, and he's got what it takes. All I want you to do, David, is to write plenty of cheerful letters to Dad and the rest leave to us. We in the home will still be here when you get back. Elick and Jack have got a housekeeper to keep the place shipshape. The Levies are the best friends anyone in the world could have. Dad's living there for as long as he wants. Harold's going home for Pesach, but I'm afraid I can't make it. And though things will never be the same at home again, we'll all stick together. And in doing so, we'll realise Mother's wish in being a happy family and help each other. Long life, David. Your brother, Sol. These letters clearly show the strength of family bonds, the importance of faith and tradition, and the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity. Harold and Solly returned as often as they could to see their father. At the time, Israel was considered an alien due to his Polish-Russian heritage, and had to report regularly to the police station, much to the brother's dismay. Father said, right, I'm, uh, I have to go to the police station now to register. We said, I beg your pardon. You have to go to the police station to register. Oh, so we went with him. And we said, right, if we can wear this uniform for England, he's not coming to register anymore. And he didn't. And he didn't. Yesterday morning, at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Forces and simultaneously to the Soviet High Command. 
This is the BBC Home Service. Here is a special news bulletin. His Majesty, King George VI, will address the nation at nine o'clock this evening as jubilant crowds gather across Britain and Europe to celebrate this long-awaited victory. We are reminded that the war against Japan continues. Solly had hazy recollections of VE Day. We had a few drinks in the bar and then we went back to our headquarters and we had a few more drinks and then we went to another bar and we had a few more drinks and I was told that I'd had a lot more drinks. <laughs> I didn't know much about that either. <laughs> it was a similar story for Harold Rose. This was one occasion when I think everybody, the, the whole unit, we had some barrels of wine and brought out and I think we all, everybody from the CO downwards, slept it off on the side of a, of a hill. Ruby joined the party. The day, I don't know, I, th I think it was some friends who were sort of singing in the streets, really. Yes, that, that's what I can remember. Uh, and I think there were lots of uh, dancers and things afterwards, uh, you know, to celebrate. Harold Burmitz was more reflective. How did you feel when war was over? Well, uh, then, of course, I was, uh, I was older by four years, four and a half years, and I was very much relieved because, uh, thank God, uh, my brother David, who was in Italy, he, he survived, my brother Sol, he survived, and uh, unfortunately we'd lost our mother during the war, or just the end of the war, and uh, she never saw David anymore because he was in Italy. While some celebrated, others waited anxiously for loved ones to return. Concerns about post-war Russia and the mighty Soviet Union. War still raged on in parts of Asia and the Pacific. There emerged new challenges and secret missions. Harold's war service took an unexpected turn. We, uh, it wasn't so much for the army. I don't know whether I should tell you this, really. It was a bit of a state secret. Uh, we sent people over to Germany and those places and brought them over to England and sent them to America who were uh, scientists. Did they come over and work for us? Yes. So very clever. Yes, I think. Yes, they did. They came to work for us. As Harold was engaged in secret missions with what we believe was a special unit called T-Force, a joint US and British Army mission to secure German scientific and industrial technology. Sadie, Harold's future wife, and Daniel's grandma, found herself in Cambridge, working on equally secretive research with significant consequences. Well, I was at school until I was 18. And then girls were called up at 18 into the forces, and I thought that I would go into the Women's Air Force. But when I went for my interview, they said I had to go on to the Women's Technical Register because I'd had a higher education. So I went for an interview at Cambridge University and I got a job as a laboratory assistant to Sir William Bragg, who was Cavendish Professor of Experimental Physics. Um. What happened there? What did you do? Well, they were doing very secret research on atomic physics and... Like the atomic bomb? Yes, it was the beginning of the, of the project that finished up in New Mexico. So it was awfully secret and everybody was under sort of military supervision and some of the scientists had been smuggled out of Europe by the forces and it was a very nervous sort of atmosphere. We had soldiers patrolling with sten guns at night and you had to mind your P's and Q's. You couldn't, you weren't supposed to talk about what was going on there. How did you feel about um, working f for such, an, such a, a powerful weapon, 
Such well, a I powerful didn't, bomb. I didn't really know what the end was supposed to be. I didn't know what the end result was supposed to be. You weren't, uh, when you were in such a, a lowly position and as young as I was, you weren't taken into anybody's confidence. This is one of the reasons why it was so nerve-wracking, because you ne never really knew what you were doing. You only got sort of hints. And If Germany had invented the atom bomb first, do you think that would have been very terrible? Do you think they'd have used it on us? Well, that was what the feeling was. People thought that the Germans had got a lot further with their research than they actually did, because most of the scientists that had the the knowledge were really anti-Nazi, and they they really obstructed the German research. When the war was over, well, when uh, America bombed Japan with the atom bomb, did you feel satisfied for what, what you did? No, I was horrified. Because all those people died? Well, it was just such a barbaric weapon. I mean, the men, the men who did, weren't killed in the war because it ended then were very relieved. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. As the war ended, the world began to uncover the atrocities committed by the Nazis. The scale of the Holocaust shocked everyone. Did you know what was happening to the Jews in Europe? Well, I, I really didn't. Um, I don't think many people did. Um, the government knew because the organisations in Europe were begging the government to bomb the camps. You know, the people, the Jewish organisations that were trying to rescue Jews. But uh, ordinary people, I mean, we sort of heard rumours, we knew Jews were being persecuted, but we certainly didn't know about the death camps. Not till they were liberated, that's when we found out. For the children of the kinder transport, like Auntie Berta, the post-war years were filled with anxious hope, longing for word of their families. For many, that hope was crushed by the harsh reality of Nazi atrocities. Well, I, I had two or three uh, postcards and letters, and then it stopped. Uh, I heard through the Red Cross uh, in about 1944 that there'd been... Um, uh, sent to a concentration camp and nothing else had been heard of them since but uh, after the war my brother uh, went back to Vienna with his wife and uh, children uh, to sort of see if he could find any relatives and he did find an aunt and uncle at the same place as they'd lived previously uh, they'd hidden somewhere in the mountains during the war and come back to Vienna. And they told him that uh, my parents' train was bombed and they never, thank God, got to the concentration camps. Which was good in some respects. Very good. Berta's brother may have tried to soften the blow, but records show their parents perished in Auschwitz. The emotional toll of these discoveries was profound, as survivors and their families grappled with the horrors they uncovered. Earlier we learned about Fred Barshak and the Welsh family, their stories of escape and hope. 
Now, as the war ended, their narratives took tragic turns. Fred Barshak, who witnessed Kristallnacht and came to Hull via the same kinder transport as Berta, discovered that his entire family had been killed in the Holocaust. The music you're hearing is called Sodage, composed by Fred's daughter, Tamara Barshak. Classically inspired for cello and piano, Sodage is an emotional state of melancholic or profoundly nostalgic longing for a beloved yet absent something or someone. Tamara has asked us to dedicate it not only to her father, but also to all the thousands of kinder who built beautiful lives in Britain for them and their descendants. It's a reminder of the importance of supporting refugees and asylum seekers who can ultimately bring so much to their new countries of residence. Robert Welsh, whose mother had helped him escape to Britain, wrote to the Red Cross seeking information. The reply he received from the refugee children's movement shattered any remaining hope. Dear Robert, you filled in research cards for your mother, Mrs Elsa Welch near Schwarz. I am very sorry to inform you that I have just received the enclosed Red Cross message, according to which your mother has been deported to its pizza on 9th of April 1942. Inquiries are now being made in its pizza on your behalf and I shall, of course, inform you immediately if I receive any further news. Please be assured of my deep sympathy in your anxiety. No further news came. She was assumed to have perished in the ghetto in Poland, not far from where Israel and Kayla started their journey 35 years earlier. One of the first British soldiers to enter the notorious concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen was Bernard Levy, a 19-year-old corporal from Hull. When Bernard arrived, 50,000 men, women and children had been killed by the Nazis. Yet, incredibly, a further 60,000 people were still clinging to life in the camp. The horrors he witnessed were so overwhelming that he couldn't speak about them for 70 years. I was confronted by chaos. People dead and living were being brought out. Oh, it was shock, horror. Soldiers after a long war are used to shock and horror. And we got on, we did our job. A lot of people. You didn't know if they were living or dead. I don't know what the first job was, clearing bodies trying to make some order inside the camp, trying to move people who were so ill they couldn't be moved. Trying to feed people who had no water and no food for days. And those who had water, it was typhus infected. Oh, it makes me feel very sad. It makes me feel the inhumanity of the place was really too much to take in at the time, so I didn't. I just got on and did my job. I wish I could have done more or at least shown more humanity. I was a boy, doing a job. That's what I did. On returning to the camp 70 years later, he said, I'm glad I'm back. This will be the last time I'll be here. I've come to say goodbye. I hope they all rest in peace. It's estimated that over 50 million people died in World War II including more than 12 million minorities and other enemies of the state in labour and concentration camps, ghettos, mass shootings and orchestrated violence. Half of this number, 6 million, were Jews. Research into Harold's family tree reveals not only those who perished, but also vast gaps. Entire family lines that abruptly ended. This represents an immeasurable loss to humanity. Potential talent in science, medicine, the arts, and countless other fields, all tragically unrealised. Of Israel's brothers and sisters who remain in Poland, Huno Bermitz actually died in the First World War as a Russian conscript. Abraham Bermitz married and escaped to Argentina, but the rest of the family were not so fortunate. Perla Bermitz was killed in the Lot's ghetto, as was Baruch, his wife Rosa, and five children. Isaac Bermitz and his wife Eleonora were both murdered in the Treblinka concentration camp, 
of their children, Henry's wife, Mindler, together with their 11-year-old son, Gustav, were murdered in the Auschwitz concentration camp, although Henry survived. Francis and Pion, who was also murdered in Auschwitz with his four-year-old daughter, Lily. Mendel and sister Fila were shot in Warsaw. Mottl joined the partisans in 1942 and died fighting. Sabina survived. Kayla and Israel's brave decision to seek sanctuary in Britain proved fateful not just for them, but for Kayla's immediate family. Inspired by their journey, Kayla's six siblings also left Poland, finding new homes in Britain and America. This timely departure ultimately saved the Waxman family from the devastation that engulfed Europe. It wasn't until 1947 that all the Burmitz brothers were finally demobilised, with David being the last to return home. As his train pulled into Platform 1 at Paragon Station in Hull, David couldn't help but think of the stories his parents had told him. Just steps away stood the reception centre where Israel and Kayla had first arrived 37 years earlier, beginning their new life in a strange land. Now their son was coming home, the family's journey having come full circle. Fifty years later, Kayla and Israel's great-grandson Daniel rekindles those memories that paint such a vivid picture of my family at war. It creates a remarkable insight into the family's history and the roles they play to guarantee his right to exist in a free society. As Daniel approached his 13th birthday and traditional bar mitzvah ceremony, he made an interesting discovery. Two years earlier, as he made his small video snapshot of family testimonies, Steven Spielberg had embarked on a similar mission, but on a global scale. The Hollywood filmmaker had established the Shoah Foundation to document voices from the Holocaust. Reflecting on this, Daniel asked me to send a copy of My Family at War to the Foundation's archive for posterity. He received back a wonderful reply from Steven Spielberg himself, extending his warmest wishes for Daniel's bar mitzvah, a day it emphasized in which they had both shared in the same traditions. The work is impressive to say the least. That it was produced when you were a young man of 11 years is astounding. You brought to life all those in your family who were part of the war. What a gift to your family members and to the children you may someday have. Daniel's school projects sparked a passion for history that would shape his future. At 18 years old, Daniel gained a place to read history at Queen Mary University of London. After graduating, he landed his first job as an events producer, where he met Marta Szymaniak from Poland, bonding over their shared love of chicken soup and pierogies. Daniel and Marta fell in love, and in a poetic turn of events, chose to marry in Poland Work then took them to Singapore, a city embodying multiculturalism and mutual respect. Now, at 39, Daniel lives in Singapore with Marta and their two daughters, Liliana and Luna. Daniel's eldest, Liliana, is now the same age as he was when he first embarked on his Family at War project. I had the pleasure of speaking with Liliana shortly after she viewed Daniel's film for the very first time. The video interview is still fresh in her mind. I think that it's really cool because since most of the people in the video it aren't here now, that I can see the recordings and see how they were like before and how the war the war was for them. And I think that it was that it's really cool that my dad was my age when he made the movie and that um, I'll always be able to also share this with my kids if I ever have kids and pass this on for generations. I mean, uh, Liliana, you live in Singapore. It's a very nice place. And people there are very respectful of each other. It's actually part of the culture of Singapore, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I've it's also a really common topic in school about um, respecting other races. And in my class, everybody's really is nice to one another. Nobody's really like mean because you're different. Like, especially for me, I'm the only person who's uh, actually fully uh, 
European, so it's so I'm kind of different, but nobody judges me for that, and I really like that as well. And you say it every day in the assembly, don't you? What yeah. what, what are the words you say every day in the assembly? Yeah. Say something like respect everyone regardless of their race, language, or religion. You do it like a pledge you put on your heart. So, so Daniel, have you got any last message for the people who are watching this that it will be towards the end of the show, they'll have seen most of the show? Really, I just think it's a, a constant reminder of you know, the human survival and really just humanity in the face of all of that evil and what they were able to overcome and how we were able to prosper on the other side. And it's something that we can never forget or take for granted. And I guess that you guys wouldn't be here if Kayla and Israel hadn't come to England in the first place all those years ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, life, life is all about decisions and and chances. And sometimes we don't know what will happen, right, if, if, we, if we make the wrong choice. But... Uh, yeah, we wouldn't be here, Liliana wouldn't be here in Singapore if they hadn't made that decision to come over to the UK when they did. And, you know, we'll always be grateful for that. And we should never forget that they really took that chance and we're here because of that. On the 25th of October, 1998, just a month after Daniel's bar mitzvah, Harold passed away unexpectedly, yet peacefully in his sleep. And in the next few years, he was joined by the rest of the family and friends we have heard from this evening. But their recorded testimony remains and will endure long after our memories fade and new generations ebb and flow across the sands of time. As we bring our story to a close, we're reminded that the memories of those who came before us are not just echoes of the past, they are the foundation of who we are today. The sacrifices made, the lives lost, and the battles fought. These are the threads that weave through our history, binding us together as one people. We would like to invite those in the audience who are family and friends of those featured in this performance to stand in unity and support. I'm sure they would be immensely proud to see all of you gathered here today. We honour them whose courage and strength continues to inspire us today. And now we extend this invitation to the entire audience. So if you're able to do so, please join us in standing. not only remember those who suffered, fought and died in World War II, but also remember all who have and continue to endure hardship and loss in persecution and conflicts. We pay tribute to their legacy and reaffirm our commitment to peace and unity. A moment of silence, please. May their memory be a blessing. Their legacy lives on through us, through our memories, our actions, and our commitments to never forget. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn at the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them.
we will remember them. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe, like, share and comment on our programmes wherever you hear this podcast. Five star reviews are especially welcome in helping us reach more people with this special series. In Harold's War, Hannah Levy played Kayla Burmitz. Robert Wade, Harold and David Burmitz. Peter McMillan, Israel, Jack and Solly Burmitz. Jonathan Levy was the narrator. Richard Avery, radio commentary and quotations. Carol's War was written by Jonathan and Hannah Levy. Produced and directed by Jonathan Levy and Richard Avery. Music published by Artlist, with the exception of Sudarje, written and performed by Tamara Barshak. Title theme, Jason Offen. Carol's War is copyright Blue Aurora Media 2024. All rights reserved.